Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. My name is Joe Davich, and welcome to Revival Lost Southern Voices. Just a few housekeeping things before we begin. If you would like to ask a question to any of our panelists after the formal presentation, please do so by using the Q&A feature that you can find on your screen. You'll see Q&A located at the top or bottom of your screen, depending on your device. Please click on it and then type your question so we can ask those in turn. Also, we've enabled live transcription for our hearing impaired patrons today. You can find the CC button at the top or bottom of your screen. And by clicking on it, you can make the font as large or as small as necessary for your reading comfort. We'd also like to remind you that we will be doing a raffle for each session of Revival Lost Southern Voices. To participate in the raffle, we do ask that you put your first and last name in the chat so that we can do a drawing and we'll be able to contact you at the end of this festival so you can come and collect your prizes. Now I would like to turn this panel over to the moderator, Joss Russell, who is a professor and director of the Creative Writing Program at Georgia State University. He's published three novels, three chapbooks, and very short prose, and hundreds of stories and essays. His most recent book is The King of Animals Stories. Welcome, Josh. Thanks, Joe. Uh, I'm very pleased to open the conference with this first panel, Literature, Art, and Music from Lost Southern Voices. Um, our panelists today are going to be Jim Clark, Caroline Herring, and Don Major. Jim Clark is Professor Emeritus at Barton College in Wilson, North Carolina, where he was Dean of the School of Humanities and the Elizabeth H. Jordan Chair of Southern Literature. His books include Notions, a Jim Clark miscellany, and two collections of poetry, Dancing on Canaan's Ruins and Handiwork. He edited, he edited Fable in the Blood, the selected poems of Byron Herbert Reese. He's released two solo CDs, Buried Land and the Service of Song, and three CDs with his band, The Near Myths. Caroline Herring is an Americana contemporary folk singer and songwriter who lives in Atlanta. She's recorded eight albums and has performed extensively throughout the US and Europe, including at the Newport Folk Festival, Merle Fest, and Austin City Limits Music Festival. Herring has appeared on Prairie Home Companion, BBC Radio 3, and NPR's All Things Considered Weekend. Her song themes revolve mostly around the US South, and she often uses her songs to tell stories about hidden or misunderstood figures within the Southern landscape. Dawn Major received her MFA in creative writing from the Etowah Valley Writing Program at Reinhardt University her BA in English from Kennesaw State University and a creative writing certificate from Emory Continuing Education. Her published work may be found at Elder Mountain, a journal of Ozark studies, Georgia Gothic Anthology, Springer Mountain Press, Five Points, The James Dickey Review, Sanctuary Journal, Sediments Literary Art Journal, and Family, Family Life Productions. Uh, she provides editorial assistance on the work of the late Southern author, William Gay, who she also enjoys lecturing about at literary conferences. Welcome everyone. I'd like to turn it over to Jim Clark. Thank you, Josh. Uh, hello, everybody. Um, happy to be here, happy to be on this panel. Um, Appalachian literature is a particular interest of mine, and uh, Don West interests me because he's one of a handful of what I think of as the first wave of major Appalachian writers, uh, and uh, they all ended up, interestingly, at Vanderbilt University in the early 1930s, uh, three of them anyway. Uh, and so that's where uh, I'll begin. By the early 1930s, the Vanderbilt fugitives, though no longer a viable group, had acquired an international reputation along with considerable influence in the world of letters. And some of them, along with new allies, were moving on to engage the realms of politics, economics, and social issues 
in the symposium that would produce the agrarian manifesto, I'll take my stand. Vanderbilt English professor Donald Davidson was rapidly becoming both the anchor and the engine of the agrarians and is the only major fugitive to stay put in the South at Vanderbilt exerted a profound influence on several young Appalachian students and budding poets who made their way to Vanderbilt in the early 1930s and who would soon become part of a remarkable first flowering of modern Appalachian literature. Jesse Stewart from Kentucky, James Still from Alabama, and Don West from Georgia. They had all graduated from Lincoln Memorial University in Harrogate, Tennessee in 1929, while Stewart uh, and Still were studying in the graduate program in English at Vanderbilt, West entered the School of Religion. Add to their number Mildred Hahn, a young short story writer from East Tennessee, and the slightly older Robert Penn Warren back in Nashville after taking his degree at Oxford. And it begins to look like quite an extraordinary group. I should point out that most of the writers I've mentioned who attended Vanderbilt have expressed some ambivalence about their time there, though to some degree this seems to be more a generalized distrust of the academy as a hospitable, hospitable place for a creative writer than a judgment upon Vanderbilt in particular. Jesse Stewart was insecure about his place and his performance at Vanderbilt, especially regarding how he measured up or failed to measure up to his fellow Kentuckian Robert Penn Warren. In a 1958 letter to Davidson, Stewart admits, although as for scholarly writing and the intensity of good writing, I don't measure up to so many of you at Vanderbilt. I know this, so I'll just have to be what I am. James Still interviewed for the Iron Mountain Review by a later Vanderbilt alumnus, Jim Wayne Miller, said, I went to Vanderbilt to graduate school. I don't know why they let me in, because I didn't know anything except what I had read. And finally, Don West, in his 1946 introduction to Clods of Southern Earth, states, yes, I got something in schools, Vanderbilt, Chicago University, Columbia, Oglethorpe, University of Georgia, Johns Hopkins, Maryland, European schools, but my best education has not been from classrooms and formal professors. My real education has been beaten into me by the everlasting toil and hunger I've seen by the struggles in textile and coal mining centers. West, in fact, wrote a poem satirizing the agrarians titled, They Take Their Stand, with a dedication for some professional agrarians, in which he characterizes them as moonlight and magnolia apologists for the Old South, noble gents who, and books so learned have writ praise to a system dead and gone. Nevertheless, despite the fact that they may have been poles apart in their politics and their social visions, Davidson and West shared a conviction about the importance of folk culture. And if West felt obliged to define himself against the agrarians, that too is a kind of influence. There's no doubt that Don West was cut from different cloth than either of his friends and contemporaries, Jesse Stewart and James Steele, or their teacher, Donald Davidson. Born a sharecropper's son in 1906 near Ella J, Georgia, West grew up in poverty, a fact which clearly affected him profoundly and led to a lifelong obsession with social justice, class, politics, and economics. West became a fiery and iconoclastic political activist preacher and social reformer, co-founded the Highlander Folk School at Mont Eagle, Tennessee, and was hounded by the FBI, the House Un-American Activities Committee, and burnt out by the KKK. He was clearly far more politically and socially progressive and forward-looking than either J Jesse Stewart or James Still. For West, words were simply the medium of his message of social reform. He was not the literary artist either of his friends aspired to be. Still, he valued and celebrated heritage and tradition as much as either, and was a champion of local folk culture much as Davidson was. In his poem, Mountain Boy, West encourages the title character, you are more than a dirty child in patched overalls, you, mountain boy, 
and informs him of his birthright. The hills are yours. The fragrant forests, the silver rivers are your heritage. Yours is the poet's life, West continues, reiterating the agrarian coupling of literature and the land. You rhyme the soil. Similarly, in Clodhopper, the Georgia cracker exults, oh, I'm the clodhopper that makes the tall corn grow, the artist that smears dignity through the speckled cotton patch. And finally, in Mountain Heritage West, despite his earlier satirical criticism of the agrarians, almost writes his own poetic version of John Crow Ransom's A Statement of Principle, from I'll Take My Stand. Here's the poem Mountain Heritage. Listen, you mountain kid or old woman or man, I would call you back to your own heritage. Must we too be lost as America is lost in a thicket of violent greed? Are we too lost to recognize our own broken image? I would point you back to an uncertain time in history when the values Appalachia gave to the South and America were rooted deep in independence and freedom. Don West, uh, oh, uh, a, a, a quote from Langston Hughes, just to show, at least during his time, uh, how uh, well known Don West was and highly regarded by important figures. Uh, here's a little uh, piece from Langston Hughes. Don West marshals words into poetry to sing for democracy and decency, to picture and plead, to startle and shock, to point out what America is and what America can be. His are the poems of our heartbeats and our longings from the cotton south to the orange grove west, as American as Route 66. Langston Hughes. Um, west, being a poet from North Georgia, uh, was good friends with Byron Herbert Reese, another important North Georgia poet. Uh, they corresponded and uh, saw each other occasionally. Uh, and uh, West wrote two poems dedicated to Byron Reese. Uh, so here, here's the first one, which is called No Lonesome Road. And it's an answer poem to uh, Byron Herbert Reese's poem, I Go By Ways of Rust and Flame, which uh, ends with the speaker, hmm, pretty much uh, acquiescing to himself. Uh, I call upon no word nor name and neither question nor reply, but walk alone as all men must upon the roads of flame and rust. Well, West counters that with this poem, No Lonesome Road. Once I too said that all men walk a solitary road and that each one must grope alone and drag his little load. I thought that I must walk forlorn upon that lonesome street, all hedged about with granite walls of pride and self-conceit. But now I've learned that all can trudge upon a common way through moonlit, moonlit night and stumbling dark or in the flaming day. And men cry out in word and name as they are passing by to those whose faith and fortitude have showed them near the sky, like Galileo at the stake, Jesus nailed to a tree, cold bleeding feet at Valley Forge are on that road with me. And I would not forget the men who dig and plow the soil and those who fight that all shall live with simple lives of toil. It is no lonesome road we tread, though so the cynics say, the poet, farmer, working man must walk a common way. So uh, you hear the progressive religion and the progressive politics of Don West in that poem, an answer to uh, uh, Byron Herbert Reese's poem. Reese, of course, sadly committed suicide uh, when he was 40 in his quarters at Young Harris College in North Georgia. And when West heard the news, he uh, memorialized uh, that sad event in a poem called Suicide for Byron Rees. A bullet, a body slumped, an empty room, a final note, a cloud of gloom, 
It was such a lonely land for the sensitive poet, for the thoughtful man. Um, here's a little poem. Uh, I can't help but think of the debate that has recently resurfaced uh, about how history should be taught and uh, what parts of history should be taught and what sort of emphases uh, should be put on the teaching of history. This is a little poem called Manifest Destiny by Don West. We never did a wrong in book and press, we're told. God made us pure and strong, and then he broke the mold. He meant us to bestow upon the lesser breeds our blessings and escrow to pacify their needs. This myth we firmly hold, writ plain on history's page, for glory, God, and gold in every war we wage. Uh, so you can hear a rather sarcastic tone there, uh, I think, in this, that poem, Manifest Destiny. Um, moving on toward uh, Don West's relationship with his daughter, uh, the folk singer Hetty West, whom Caroline will talk about in just a moment. Uh, this is a poem of West called Anger in the Land, which is about a lynching, uh, and it was put to music by Hetty West and recorded by her on her uh, second solo album, and also became a fairly popular tune on one of uh, Peter, Paul, and Mary's records. Uh, so Anger in the Land, which Hetty took significant liberties with, rearranging uh, the, uh, the, the, uh, the verses and uh, leaving out a few and so forth. Oh, there's grieving in the plum grove, and there's weeping in the weeds. There's sorrow in the shanty where a broken body bleeds. For there's been another lynching, and another grain of sand swells the mountain of resentment. Oh, there's anger in the land. And a woman broods in silence close beside an open door. Flung across the flimsy doorstep lies a corpse upon the floor. You'll not ask me why I'm silent. Thus the woman spoke to me. Her two eyes blazed hot with anger and her throat throbbed agony. Let the wind go crying yonder in the treetops by the spring. Let its voice be soft and feeling like it was a living thing. Once my heart could cry in sorrow. Now it lies there on the floor. In the ashes by the hearthstone, they can't hurt it anymore. Did you ever see a lynching, ever see a frenzied mob mill around a swaying body when it's done the hellish job? Oh, there's grieving in the plum grove, and there's sobbing in the sand. There's sorrow in the shanties, and there's anger in the land. And then lastly, a very short little sketch, a poetic sketch of his daughter, Hetty. Uh, this is from a poem called Hospital Waiting which he wrote while his wife, Connie, was uh, in the hospital for a prolonged stay. Uh, and uh, so here's his description of, uh, of his daughter, Hetty. Then, then Hetty, with the stubborn chin, yours and mine, Hetty of the singing lips and compulsive drive, gathering snakes and lizards, and to whom all mountains were invitations to climb, a bundle of questions asking for answers. Hetty, the hungry one, strong with the strength to take life by the hand and walk with it in light places and in the dark. So now, Caroline Herring is going to tell us more about Hetty West and I think uh, sing us a few songs by Hetty West. So, Caroline. Thank you, Jim. <clears throat> That was fascinating, and it um, a father and a son and a daughter can uh, influence each other so much, and uh, one life leads to another. Hetty definitely uh, was her father's daughter. She loved the mountains. She was born in Cartersville, Georgia. Uh, her uh, family played banjo and fiddle, and so many of the songs she played all her life, she knew and sang as a child. Uh, she was on the stage from a young age. Uh, she was also quite an international figure. 
She left the South uh, for college. She studied drama at Columbia University. And at the, in the early 60s, she noticed in New York that there was a folk revival based on all the songs she had sung her entire life. She met Pete Seeger. She sang alongside him at a Carnegie Hall show. Uh, she then moved to Los Angeles and played out there for a time. She played at Newport Folk Festival. She played uh, again with Pete Seeger. She started going to London quite a lot and eventually moved to London and uh, married again there. She had several marriages, some only of convenience. Uh, uh, one friend uh, of hers who was gay in London married her so that she could go back and forth between the US and England on a regular basis. And uh, she uh, was um, definitely protesting against the Vietnam War. She said that um, we'll be controlled by manipulated fear. Uh, and she lived in New York at the same time that Jean Ritchie did. Uh, they influenced each other. Uh, she then moved to Western Germany, uh, was fluent in German. I was listening to some of her um, concerts and she would talk in German while she was playing Appalachian folk tunes. It was it's really extraordinary. And in Germany, she learned a type of folk music style where the uh, musicians there would talk some of the time during their songs and then sing some of the time. And really the closest thing I can compare that to maybe is rap, where, where so much is spoken word uh, in a song that I've heard. Uh, after she recorded several albums also in Germany, one, uh, her most famous title of an album was Whores, Hell, and Biscuits. And that would not work in the United States. Um, it was, uh, Whores, Hell, and Biscuits has stuck with me so much. I'm forgetting, yeah, I know Hell and Biscuits are in there and something else, we'll have to figure that out. Um, I'll find that in a minute. Then she moved back uh, to New York. She taught at Stony Brook. Um, Students studied her uh, a lot. Uh, she then moved to Philadelphia. She was playing her entire life. She had cancer uh, late in her life that took her voice. She had one daughter, Talitha. So this woman was just extraordinary in that she was totally based in traditional music. She wrote a ton about working class. That was her focus her entire life was working class uh, and injustice. And then she wrote, um, though obviously influenced by traditional music, she wrote 500 Miles, which she doesn't often um, get credit for, but it doesn't change the fact that she wrote it. And of course, a lot of that, she heard that melody from her uncle uh, when she was a little girl. And I'll sing that at the end. But um, I want to start with uh, Hard Times Cotton Mill Girls. Uh, and uh, in it is mentioned Ella J. Their uh, song, that I was listening to a song about Adairsville, blues in Adairsville or something like that. I mean, she's talking about Georgia uh, all the time in her songs. Um, it's really wonderful. So, uh, this is called Hard Times, Cotton Mill Girls. It was first recorded by the Journeyman in 1962. Now she was a banjo player. She was an extraordinary banjo player. She played claw hammer and a unique style of banjo that was between bluegrass and old time. And people really marveled at it. And I don't play the banjo yet, but I want to now that I was the Hetty West. <laughs> so try to imagine a banjo. I worked the cotton mill all my life. I ain't got nothing but a barlow knife. Hard times, cotton mill girls, hard times everywhere. Hard times, cotton mill girls, hard times, cotton mill girls, hard times, cotton mill girls, it's a hard time everywhere. 
1915, I heard it said, go to cotton country and get ahead, but it's hard times, cotton milk girls, hard times everywhere, hard times, hard times, cotton milk girls, hard times, cotton milk girls, the hard time everywhere. From Gilmer to Barlow's, a long, long way down Carter K, Viola J. It's hard times, cotton mill girls, hard times everywhere. Oh, hard times, hard times, cotton mill girls, hard times. It's a hard time everywhere. Us kids work 12 hours a day for 14 cents and no copay. A hard times, cotton mill girls, a hard times everywhere. Hard times, hard times, cotton mill girls, hard times. It's hard times everywhere. Old man Allen, he thinks he's fine. He's got his hands in his pockets. He ain't got a dime, but it's hard times. Cotton mill girls, hard times everywhere. And it's hard times. Cotton mill girls, hard times. Cotton mill girls, hard times. It's hard times everywhere. Ain't it enough to break your heart? Have to work all day and at night it's dark. It's hard times. Cotton mill girls, it's hard times everywhere. Hard times. Hard times, got mill girls, hard times, it's hard times everywhere. When I die, don't bury me at all, just hang my body on the spinning room wall, pickle my bones and alcohol, it's hard times everywhere. It's hard times, hard times, got mill girls, hard times, it's hard times everywhere. One thing I love about Betty West is her thorough knowledge of um, English and Scottish balladry. Uh, there's a long tradition. The American Songbook is filled with songs that came with the immigrants from uh, England, Scotland, Ireland. They certainly came from other places, but the people who recorded the songs were mostly also from England. In Scotland and uh, many of those like Cecil Sharp who um, did tons of uh, transcriptions thousands and thousands he did not like former slave songs he didn't like he hated religious songs he didn't want songs about war he didn't want songs about anything but English songs of love and death and so there are a lot of them that made it to us um, that we sing, like Knoxville Girl um, and so many others. But there is a, uh, a song, they, they fill her eight albums and there are not many people in the United States folk singers who sing The Wife of Usher's Well. Um, so she did. Now, and just to give you a little example, so I found this on the Guardian website. It was the poem of the week in October, 2021. So Wife at Usher's Well was uh, found by Sir Walter Scott uh, and he wrote about it in his songs of the Scottish border. Uh, but Francis James Child made it his ballad, Child uh, Ballad 79. So all of these, you know, these scholars recorded them. Uh, one thing I love in the, so much of the, um, British balladry. It's going to be a lot less religion and a lot more about spirits and witches and um, not, it's, it's wonderful. Like this, uh, the wife at Usher's Well sent her, son, her three sons off to work and they die. And if you mourn your uh, loved one for more, for more than a year and a day, their spirits will come back and it is unpleasant. And uh, they say, when word came to the Carlin wife that her three sons were gone, they hadn't have been a week from her, a week but barely ain. One word came to the Carlin wife that her three sons were gain. And uh, Carlin means old woman or and or witch, which is, outstanding, but uh, we don't know if a witch says this or the mother says this. I wish the wind may never cease nor fascism the flood, 
till my three sons come hang to me in earthly flesh and blood. Blow up the fire, my maidens, bring water from the well, for in my house shall feast this night, since my three sons are well. And it's all of that sort of language, of course, and they can't eat their mother's meal because they are ghosts. So the American version, one of them, of course, there were tons, uh, is more religious. Jesus is in there pretty quickly. Uh, and so I will sing a bit of it for you and I'll just sing it a cappella. But this was on her album, Old Times and Hard Times, which I believe she recorded in West Germany. There was a woman and she lived alone and baby she had three. She sent them away to the North Country to learn their grammar. They'd not been gone but a very short time, scarcely six weeks to the day when death, cold death, spread through the land and swept them babes away. She prayed to the Lord in heaven above, wearing a starry crown. Oh, send to me my three little babes tonight or in the morning soon. She set the table for them to eat upon it spread bread and wine come eat come drink my three little babes come eat come drink of mine oh mother we cannot eat your bread neither can we drink your wine for the morrow morning at the break of day, our Savior must, we must rejoin. And then at the end, rise up, rise up, said the eldest one. Rise up, rise up, said she. For the morrow morning at the break of day. Our Savior must, oh, must we see cold clouds of clay roll o'er our heads. Green grass grows on our feet and our sweet tears, my mother dear, will wet our winding sheet. And I'm going to finish with um, 500 Miles, uh, which has been sung by everybody. I guess made most famous by Peter, Paul, and Mary. And you usually hear it, you know. If you miss the train I'm on, you will know that I am gone. Well, she did not sing it that way. So again, imagine the banjo. If you miss the train I'm on, you will know that I am gone. You can hear the whistle blow a hundred miles, hundred miles, hundred miles, hundred miles. You can hear that whistle blow a hundred miles. Lord, I'm one, Lord, I'm two, Lord, I'm three, Lord, I'm four, Lord, I'm 500 miles away from home, away from home, 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 away from home, Lord, I'm 500 miles away from home. If my honey sits on the railroad no more, Lord, I'd sidetrack my engine and go home. Go home, 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 and go home. Lord, I'd sidetrack my engine and go home. Lord, I told my little 
little Eller, just as plain as I could tell her, she'd better come along and go with me. Go with me, 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 go with me. She'd better come along and go with me. If this train runs me right, I'll be home tomorrow night, for I'm coming down the line on number nine. Number nine, 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 number nine. Lord, I'm coming down the line on number nine. My shoes are all worn and my clothes are all torn. Lord, I can't go back home this away. This away, way, way, this away. Lord, I can't go back home this away. If you miss a train I'm on, you'll know that I am gone. You can hear the whistle blow a hundred miles, a hundred miles, 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 a hundred miles. You can hear the whistle blow a hundred miles. Thank you, Hetty West. Well, thank you, Caroline. Um, I'd like to hand it off to our third panelist now. Um, if Dawn is there, Dawn, would you like to tell us a little bit about William Gay now? Yes, um, I can't believe I'm following her. <laughs> oh boy, I'm trying to share my screen now. Sorry, guys. Uh, Can you see it? Oops. Can you guys see this? Someone chat me or something. I'm worried about it. Not yet gone. No, you can't. Um, I don't know what I'm doing wrong. Look down at the bottom maybe for the green share screen. Yeah, it went away. Let me escape out of this and do. Uh, share screen. I don't know why it's not working. I've hit it. You still don't see it? Some people are saying that they do. I'm not seeing it on my screen though yet. Yep, it started. There you go. Okay. But is it, do you see the stuff on the side? Yeah, so just hit, yeah, hit from beginning right there. All right. Is that good? You got it. Sorry, y'all. <laughs> Little difficulties there. That's been my week. Okay. So um, I'm just going to go into a little bit of back history on William, and then I'll get into the good stuff about his paintings. Um, so William was born in Lewis County, Tennessee, between 1939 and 1943. I know there's a big difference there, but um, he grew up really poor, and they don't really have a clear birth certificate on him, but they do celebrate his birthday October 27th. That date's kind of questionable as well. Um, his family didn't own a car or have electricity, and they just grew up extremely poor. After graduating high school, he joined the Navy, and he served in Vietnam off the coast of the South Sea, And but he didn't care for authority, and he did not like <laughs> his experience there. So he meanders around the country for a while, and he um, Lands back in Hollowall, Tennessee, and he gets married and has four kids. Um, during this time, he's writing. He's been writing since he was really very young, like I think around 10 or something. Um, but he's been writing and also painting at the same time, but he considers writing to be his real job. And so he just did mineral, manual labor jobs like carpentry and, and drywall and painting and stuff. And he would work just enough to get enough money to you know, subsidize his writing and then he would quit maybe hunt ginseng in, in, the, in the woods. So this didn't bode too well for his marriage. And so after the kids graduated from high school, him and his wife got divorced. 
Now he's sending work out this entire time, but uh, William was sending it to the big, big, big dogs like the Atlantic and New Yorker. And um, he also was sending handwritten work as well. He hadn't really mastered the typewriter. So he realizes that he needs to concentrate on the smaller presses and his daughters help him put together some work and he starts sending it out and he gets, he's kind of hit all at once. And he gets published in the Missouri Review and the Georgia Review in the same year. And then his first book comes out, Promises Tonight, which is published by Doubleday. So now he's actually starting to make um, an income off of his writing. Um, he was awarded the Warren Penn Award and Guggenheim Award. Um, and he finally, finally met this point, and then he dies in 2012. He, ha he hadn't started getting published until he was almost 60 years old. Um, and then because of that, and because of, because of him dying without a will, his voice could potentially have been lost forever had not the family and friends stepped in and you know, gathered that work and transcribed it because he did write in longhand. And it was really an act of love. Um, but it's important to remember that he was completely self-taught and he got his education essentially from a library in the five and dime. So uh, probably most of you are familiar with William Gay as the quintessential Southern Gothic artist. Um, he's a writer and um, in the tradition of Faulkner and Flannery O'Connor and um, Cormac McCarthy, who he actually would correspond with. We have those correspondence as well. And they would send work back and forth to each other. But you might not be aware that he was also painting and he was a folk artist. So I'm going to go to, this is William in Hollandwall, Tennessee, with one of his paintings, which would become the cover for Wittgenstein's Leah and Iceman. And there's a better picture I'm going to show you here. He often painted images of roads and I always thought that that suggested someone who was either wanting to escape or trying to uh, get back home, <laughs> maybe opposite extremes of each other. Now he wanted to have all of his, you know, he wanted to use his paintings for all of his covers. And that has been the aim of what we, who we call Team Gay, which is a group of people that have been working to get his work out there since he passed away. This is uh, the cover for Stoneburner and Paul Nietzsche designed this cover. So I just want to show you the image and, and what it turned out to be after it became the cover. This is the earliest known image that we have. We, uh, he was a teenager, I believe, when he painted this. Someone found out that he was interested in painting and gave him a paint by numbers. A kit, which you can see on one side is the clown. And, you know, he kind of bucked authority and decided to paint what he wanted to paint. And he painted this train on a really high trestle and it used to hang in his mother's over her mantle until she passed away. You see a tendency towards dark colors. His, his paintings are really similar to his, um, to his writing. I mean, there, you won't ever find a painting that's like a bright, vivid, happy color. It's all very neutral tones, uh, grays, blues, browns. Uh, like most folk artists who can't afford you know, canvases, William would use what, what's available to him. And so he repurposed paneling. And this is an image of one of that's the back of it. It's Michael White, the lead archive is holding it up. And this is, he painted on this side because he thought it held the paint better. But he also would paint on album covers and cardboard. This is another early image of Williams. This is when he painted this when he was in the Navy. And this is of course when he was in the Navy. Um, now this is kind of a funny story. He wrote a memoir called Calves Howling at the Moon. And um, he painted pictures for his family as Christmas presents. And so he had painted this image for his father when he was on this destroyer late at night, he had found a quiet place to read and write. And he also thought, well, this would be a good place for me to paint this, you know, a Christmas present. So this division officer burst in on him and thought that he was smuggling in Taiwanese prostitutes or smoking pot. <laughs> and then he took exception to William's wolves. He thought they were way too plump and fluffy and he called them cows howling at the moon or calves howling either one and that's what became the title of a memoir that William wrote about painting the south. Um, in that same memoir William talks about, he doesn't really go too much into details about influences from other artists I and mean, he was really influenced from the rural landscapes that inhabit it 
but he does mention Andrew Wyeth and Christina's world in particular. Uh, so, the, you know, the subject here is, you know, the rural landscapes, right? And I, and I think that's something that's always his subject. But I, I look at this picture and I think about William when he, he got to take this Andrew Wyeth art book home when he was in fourth grade because he was always really neat and tidy with things. And he, that image always stuck with him. And I always thought, I thought about this image of this lady who was actually suffering from some muscular disorder and would not use a wheelchair. She would crawl around town. This is a neighbor of Wyeth's. And just like the perspective of this lady looking out in the distance, it made me think of, you know, William didn't, he, the art world and the writing world wasn't accessible to him because he didn't have the education and he was in extreme poverty. So to me, this talks about, this image reminds me, thinks you think of William's psychology. You know, there's something just out in the distance that he can't quite have. And then there's a quote here. Um, this is from Stories from the Attic that's coming out. It's a collection of short stories and some memoir and musical criticism, but it's coming out in June, June 22nd by Zank. And I found this quote from, move this over the way. Oops. The yard was treeless and grassless as a gray house as the gray house had the stark austerity of the landscape by Wyeth. So that image really did stick in his head all this time. And then um, there is a short story uh, called The Light Painter where he has his character Tidewilder who becomes this famous painter because he can capture light but like no one else. And there's a scene um, in The Light Painter where Tidewilder is walking out into the hurricane and if you're I'm familiar with the hurricane. It's it's William Gay's haunted forest. It's always one of his settings. And um, here, let me show where it's at. And he's coming out, and he comes out to a cusp of beech trees. And that, I mean, it's so fun for me to match up. You know, it's subjective, but it's so fun to try to match up this prose with his paintings. And when I find one, I, I we all share it with each other. William was also really fond of painting windows. Uh, he painted them a lot of windows. This is one of the examples. And I thought that suggested someone, there's a sense of voyeurism in his painting and in his writing. Um, I think it's one of his working symbols. And oftentimes he describes characters looking inside of shop windows that they can't, something that they can't afford, like a typewriter, for instance, or things or people and lives that the character is excluded from. And then this, this is from, this is the, I just kind of matched this prose up with the, uh, with the uh, light painter and time been done will we know more, which is another collection. He painted firelight flickering through a window, lantern light from a sleigh on the reefs of drifted snow, soft yellow lamplight falling through a window on snowy mountains. They were pictures of a time that was irrevocably gone and perhaps had never truly been. switching directions a little bit. Um, William was fascinated with the legend of the Bell Witch and he visited the location twice in his lifetime. And he wrote Little Sister Death based on that legend. It's a pretty famous legend, Robinson County, Tennessee. This is the falling part. This is what he loves this kind of stuff though. This is the witch's cottage. And then this is the image that he painted. I'm gonna, I'm gonna pull it up so you can see a little bit closer. Right here between the trees, there's a ghost. It's just, I think it's just so fun. Now, this isn't from Little Sister Death, but I've always associated this quote, this, this, this lines with this painting. The feeling that off somewhere in the bracken man and boy still locked rose in him, nor would it abate. With their steps locked in sync with his, they paced them in the silent black wood, passed through the bowls of trees like revenants, a moon the color of yellowed ivory, cradled up out of the dark, and he could see them moving through the trees, transparent as water, insubstantial as a handful of smoke. I think you can see those ghosts there. I believe in ghosts, so I think they're there. And this is from Futures of the Harp, Living from Press just came out with it last year, so you wanna get a copy of that, it's his last novel. Look closely in the doorway, there's a form there. 
I'm just going to read this quote that I believe goes along with it. Then the door opened slightly inward, a rectangle of darkness deeper still. On it, a pale wrath-like shape printed itself like a moving image forming on a photographic plate. William's uh, written word is populated with spirits and ghosts and witches and necromancers and all kinds of speculative Im images, um, imagery. And so, and that, that comes out in his art as well. This has been, this is what I really have fun with. I recently went up to Hallamall, Tennessee and I got the grand tour of his town, which consists of like one stop sign or maybe it was a stoplight. I mean, it's this tiny, tiny town. And I went there with Michael White, who says the lead archivist, and I got to meet uh, a couple of Williams' you know, relatives. I got to meet Chris Gay, and um, uh, I met his grandkids. I went Chris' wife, and it was just cool to get their insights and ask some questions because one of the things I'm that the team is working on is trying to map his fictional settings with his real settings, and. Uh, Chris pointed this out. I said, I'm trying to find this painting where he painted the cab stand. And I think it might be this. And he said it was on South Maple. So this is actually, this is the rise. The rise, I can't ever really say right. It's the rise if you're from the South, but I think it's the rise actually. It's, it's a pool hall and beer, uh, a, a honky tonk really, just a bear joint. And this is the actual building you see where it's been bricked over with the doors and windows have been bricked over on, on South Maple. And um, I actually got to, now I'm friends with the librarian. I love librarians, thank you so much for you. And um, she's the historian and the archivist for the town and the, and the local librarian. And she knew William personally. And she went through all these um, phone books trying to find out where, because it's kind of odd that you'd have a cab stand in such a small town. Um, but it wasn't just a cab stand. It's actually, they actually got raided in like 1962 or yeah, 1962 for selling whiskey. So these places that they would deliver beer or whiskey as well. That was one of my major finds. And this is just, um, so with, with, this is a setting that William goes back to over and over again, this cab stand. And um, it kind of changes throughout the years. It's, it starts out not being so nefarious. With Futures of the Heart, it's, a, it's pace, it's, uh, it's like the 1940s. And um, Yates sees it for the first time in Futures of the Heart. And he's trying to get back to Allen's Creek, but someone suggests that he takes a cab and, you know, obviously he was not going to be able to afford it. But he talks about uh, seeing this, this image for the first time Yes, okay. The plate glass window said Helton's dry cleaner, but someone had painted through it and written Defy's cat company beneath it. The window had been broken and attached by an elaborate spider web of masking tape and was slightly concave and had a fragile look to it. Then it goes a step further because Ace actually enters this door, right? and he describes what he sees there. Inside was a long, narrow room, cool and dark and cavernous, a fan word somewhere overhead, moving the layers of smoke about. The only light came from the rear where a suspended fluorescent light illuminated a pool table with a bright cold clarity of a green vice autopsy table. Yates stood for a moment blinking and letting his eyes adjust to the gloom. Two figures like shadow men moved ritualistically about the table, the soft click of pool balls, the murmur of voices. Now, William explored the same setting in the Lost Country. And, and this is Edgewater, who is now living above this location. And the town has kind of gotten, it's become very shady. Some nights, Edgewater would climb the stairs to the apartment over the pool room and stand outside the door and sit for a minute on the top step and wait. The stairwell was ancient concrete. A green lichen grew there, faintly or fluorescent. The stairwell was concrete as well, blackened by generations of feet, carpeted by film, of ground in crime and debris and cigarettes, and accumulated filth of years. This is uh, that, as you recognize, we call it the witch's cottage, but he really didn't title any, any of his paintings. And then we just kind of come up with titles for them, you know, based on what we find and or what I found in the, in the 
in his work. But this is what's fit. This is the, from the gallery copy of Zach. So you guys will be able to pre-order this. Um, and I wanted to just read you uh, what he said about writing in the South. And this is from um, Cap Telling at the Moon. And he says of the South, it's a good place to find subjects to paint or to write about because it's a place obsessed with time by lives once lived here, the very atmosphere scored by hard times and rough ways. All these lost lives seem to exist and go on uninterrupted around you and every day, every life exists simultaneously. Everyone layered like stacks of image glass that held to light show all these past lives without precedent or priority. Time itself becoming pliable and of no moment. If you try to paint this landscape, a force that is invisible and just outside the frame, but they're all the same, seems to affect whatever you're laying on the canvas. So I'm gonna I'm gonna end there, but I just wanted to say, okay, you may ask yourself, well, why is this important? you know, that William painted these images. I mean, besides it's really cool finding links between his artwork and his prose, why is this significant to us? And I, you know, I believe this is just a world, a world building author. And because he used the same mythology as some of our most famous world building authors. And it's important because I also think that William was building a Southern mythology by mapping out his settings, by painting these images um, and having, going back to the same settings, same people, the haunted hurricane, the Ackermans filled his town. I do believe he's, he's this is this is the, the the work of a world building author, and we need to we really need to honor that. So that's it. Thank you. Thanks, Don. Um, I will, I'm going to read some questions here. So, um, Don, if you could stop sharing your screen, I think our heads will become bigger. Yay, there we are. And um, if Don and Caroline and Jim want to come back on screen, that would be good too. Um, so I'm gonna do these in order of how I saw them come up in the chat. And we have a Q&A section. Remember, if you are interested in asking a question of the panelists, you can pop it into the Q&A. I think there are a couple in the chat that I'll try to get to first. Um, the first one that I see is for Jim. And um, I have managed to quickly scroll away from it for some reason here. Let me see where to go. Jim, um, you said in your presentation that West claimed that instead of formal university knowledge, his real learning came from real life, like the struggles of coal miners. Uh, could you read us another short poem that demonstrates West's depiction of real life struggles or point us toward one if you don't have one at hand? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, and of course, he wrote about primarily um, uh, textile mill workers and miners and sharecroppers, particularly. Here's a little poem called Factory Child, since uh, Caroline sang the song um, Cotton Mill Girls. Uh, this is kind of one of those cotton mill girls. What chance now for Margaret Biggs to grow in stature, heart, and head? She breathes foul dust and rotted lint among the wheels to earn her bread. And while her lungs are eaten out, her eyes stare hungri hungrily through space, eyes that sink at eventide within a shallow, longful face. Better for her if she had gone from womb of flesh into the earth, or if she had not come at all to cause some woman pangs of birth. Soon she will have a pauper's grave, pitted deep and nameless side, another child for potter's field, while churchmen sing and praise their God. A uh, little bit of a William Blake kind of uh, feel there at the end, too. But uh, plenty of poems about uh, the hardworking miners and sharecroppers, as well as factory workers. Great. And I have one that connects the two of you. You just connected your two presentations, but there's a question that comes up. Um, do you know if Hetty ever set any of her father's poetry to music? Yes, I see nodding. 
<laughs> he did, didn't he, Jim? Uh, yeah, right. Well, the, the, the poem that I read, uh, Anger in the Land, that's, uh, right. that's one of West's poems, and Hetty set that to music, um, uh, rearranging the verses and leaving out a few verses. Uh, the song Cotton Mill Girl, uh, West has a prose piece in one of his collection uh, called Hard Times Cotton Mill Girl, and in which he tells the story of his aunt who used to sing a similar song, and he includes various verses of the song which are very similar to the song that Caroline sang and um, sometimes uh, sometimes Hetty said she found that song she collected it from someone uh, other people suspect that she probably wrote a good bit of it herself based on these verses that her father would sing to her uh, that his aunt used to sing to him those are the only two that I know of for sure, but uh, maybe there are more. Um, we have a question for Dawn. Dawn, um, is there an estimate or is there a, a, a known number of the paintings that William Gay produced? Um, yeah, we think it's under a hundred. I know that's not a great, you know, yeah, under a hundred, but I mean, uh, we're trying to collect them as they come available. Sometimes the family will, you know, become desperate and they're still not in great, you know, very poor and we'll, we'll sell them. But then sometimes they feel bad about it and want them back. So <laughs> it's like, you kind of go back and forth with it. Uh, one day I, I really hope that we can do a whole display and can do it together and just matching up the pros with the paintings. It's been just a wonderful experience. So are they currently, is, is there a, uh, a collector or an archive that has yeah. a lot of them? There is a website. And if you Google the William Gay archive, you can see some of the paintings there. You can see the, the work that was, you know, he has a manuscript that was actually stolen that was recovered. And, um, and you can see like how he wrote, he would write on the page and then flip it over and write on the next page and then kind of write on the side. I mean, it was, it's just insane. But if you go to the website, just type that in Google, you can see more of the images. And um, yeah, the, the paintings are there. And then some of them are, the, the writing, it started out being with Swanee. So it's there, but the paintings are, it's kind of, they're kind of in two different places. Okay. Um, we need a museum. <laughs> we really do. Yeah. Always, always good to find an angel donor for that kind of thing, right? Because I'm sure, uh, especially if he's painting them on the back of paint by numbers stuff, that that uh, those materials weren't really designed to be long lasting right. or acid free or any of the things yeah. that we now yeah. expect. They're not protected like you want them to be. All right. Um, Maybe there's a donor out there now. <laughs> <laughs> That always a good thing if the donor is out there. Uh, it looks like uh, uh, our uh, our overseers from the Georgia Center for the Book um, are dropping in WilliamGay.net/slash paintings into the thing. So if you look in the chat, those of you who are attending, you can find some interesting things going on. Um, the, one of the questions that draws together a question about uh, William Gay's art and about the about Hetty West is um, first to you, Don. Do you know was Gay painting and writing at the same time, or was he a visual artist before he became a writer? Um, or does he anyone was, know? Yeah, he was more interested in writing. But I mean, I, this is what you just you never you never know. You just wonder where he could have ended up if he had had the formal training, but then maybe it wouldn't be as good. Maybe it wouldn't be William Gay if he had, you know, if he went and got an MFA like I did, <laughs> you know, but no, he started writing, uh, Thomas Wolfe was, uh, Look How Born Angel really impacted him. And from there he wanted to be a writer, um, but he would paint when he could, or if he had the material. I mean, he was using crushing up walnuts to write as a young kid to make ink out of walnuts. So, but the painting, you know, that, that was secondary. Um, you know, you just you just wonder if so, you, someone who didn't have access to like what we have had. Yeah, or just the fact that you can go into Target now if you live 
uh, out in the woods, you can go to town and go to Target and there are art supplies in a way that there weren't even 20 years ago. Um, yeah. Caroline, the, the connected question was, uh, do you think that uh, Hetty was a lyricist or a songwriter? Um, in other words, did she, was she starting with the lyrics or was she starting with the tune and the rhythm? Or does anyone know? Well, I think it depends on what comes first to a baby. Mm -hmm. Because I think she heard these tunes and these songs uh, from infancy. And so, you know, uh, I, I suppose she probably did them every which way, but her melodies are very traditional. And so, you know, I think it's all um, a bit of a mix. I, I don't know exactly, but uh, so many of the songs that she sang, people everywhere take in verses, they put out, you know, they pull out verses. Um, the words change so much, the melody changes so much. It's not your normal songwriting experience because it's all of this culture and this history and they're kind of distilled and they were sung to her as a baby. So um, that's a good question. I mean, when she, I don't know that she wrote any in German. I don't know that she sang any of these in German. Do you, Jim? No, I don't. That That's interesting. I wonder. Yeah. Um, so I, I don't know, but they were both, uh, pretty deep. Yeah, and it, it seems interesting to me too, because one of the things that I think, you know, connects everybody on this panel and the, the, um, the artists who you're talking about is this idea of the way that, um, that kind of culture infused the work um, and that it really was, and for a lot of them, um, an issue of hybridizing things, of bringing together, for example, in Don West's thing, I mean, he can say, oh yeah, my real education happened outside of the university, but clearly what he was doing was bringing together that formal education and the informal education that he was getting to kind of make a new thing in the same way that Hetty West was bringing together kind of all of this folk tradition, but then also that kind of contemporary folk tradition that was happening in Germany and New York City to make a new thing and the way that that William Gay also was kind of pulling from Thomas Wolfe and Faulkner and O'Connor and all of that kind of long southern gothic tradition and then you know the also obviously kind of the, the one of the huge influences for a lot of those writers the King James, the language of the King James Bible, and then kind of doing, and Cormac McCarthy as well does this too, kind of that idea of describing the ugly thing in a beautiful way. And there is nothing more gruesome than a Southern murder ballad. No. I mean, they rival Cormac McCarthy any day of the week. Yeah, true. And that's probably where a lot of McCarthy's stuff is coming from is out of that, that juxtaposition, right? Uh, the ugliness and the beauty. I mean, if you just think about, I won't go on and on, but I have, I have thought about this before, about the way in which, for example, um, mill life works, right? You kind of go to a beautiful place and then you build a mill that destroys it, right? Because that's where the raw uh, materials are in this gorgeous place. All right. Um, I'm now looking suddenly the chat's going and the Q and a, uh, one quick last question. I don't want to go take us too far over time here, but, uh, we can close it with this. Maybe, uh, Fred Chapel says writing his poem helps him write his fiction and vice versa. Did Gay overtly talk about the way his painting and fiction fed each other? Or was that more, is this kind of something that we've found out about after the fact? No, he does. I mean, he talks about painting the South and I think writing the South was 
very similar. That's that memoir I mentioned, Cal Telling at the Moon. That's a good one to go to. Um, but he doesn't, you know, he, occasionally when I'm going through his work, I'll see him mention someone like he does mention Wyeth, you know, that's one that stuck with him. And he talks about that in that memoir. But, you know, I just felt when I was, I did my master's thesis on, on the, like, the speculative image and the images and the um, mapping of its world. And I was like, he mapped this out. I didn't show you guys that image, but I believe it's on the archive. And I'm like, this is a world building thing. Um, and then, then I start looking at the images of his paintings and going, wait, this is, this might actually be here, you know? And then, you know, you're just making those connections as you read. Anyone can do it. Like, I really hope that people do that. I hope that once you go, you guys go back to read William Gay, look at the stuff on the archive and, and send it to me if you find something, because I, we are mapping this out. I eventually want to have an actual map. But um, as far as saying, you know, especially because he didn't title anything, the only one, actually, the capstan is the only one that we know that we can connect to it because he did the lettering, but it was, it was like complete hell. He hated doing the lettering. So he, he would repaint the same image over and over, and per, like kind of perfecting it. And that, there's another one of those images of the cab stand without the lettering because he hated doing it so much. But I thank God that he did that because, you know, how would I have made all these little, you know, right. leaks, you know? Well, thank you you all for being here and giving such great presentations and thank everybody for attending this first panel i think joe's going to take over but i'll say that i had a great time being here and uh i hope you all enjoy the rest of the of the the, the panels thanks josh Thank you so much, Josh. And thank you, Caroline, Jim, and Dawn for joining us today. Don't forget we have one more panel this afternoon at four o'clock that you can still register for. This is called Rediscovering Frank Yerby and it features Valerie Matthews, Matthew Touch, Veronica Watson, and it will be moderated by Eli Arnold. I'd also like to thank all of you for participating in the raffle. We had guests from 13 states in addition to Georgia today joining us and folks from as far away from us, London, England. Um, I do want to take a moment and congratulate our raffle winner for panel one, Jane Thorpe. We will be contacting you shortly and getting those prizes out to you. Once again, thank you all so much for attending. We will see you at four o'clock today and throughout the weekend. Have a wonderful afternoon. <laughs>